we need to invest in all Americans. What resources can we provide to homeowners, whether they're buying or selling? Right now on NBC4, redlining, past and present. In this episode of Inequality in America, we're exploring how this practice, banned more than 50 years ago, is still impacting our communities. Thanks for joining us. I'm Sean Yancey. We're here in the Bloomingdale neighborhood of Washington, D.C., not far from Howard University, an historically black university. This tree-lined street was once one of many in our area where people of color were denied the American dream of home ownership. To understand how this still affects us today, let's take a step back in time. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. It was the end of the Great Depression. Banks had collapsed, one in four Americans was out of work, and the middle class was crumbling. President Franklin D. Roosevelt's plan for rebuilding the economy was through the New Deal, which created government programs to help Americans get jobs and save money. Home ownership is the basis of a happy, contented family life. It also created a mortgage insurance program so people could buy and keep their homes, but not everyone was able to take advantage. Andre Perry with the Brookings Institution tells us most of the government insured loans were given to white families. We saw that, fo that white people who um, essentially were broke during the depression were empowered financially by policies and we could not take advantage of many of those housing policies because the federal government, the federal agency drew red lines around our neighborhood deeming them unworthy. Maps at the National Archives show how it worked. Neighborhoods were divided in four color-coded categories. Green was best, blue, desirable, yellow, declining. And places where black Americans or immigrants lived typically fell into the last group, red or hazardous to investment. Private banks followed those government ratings. People could not refinance their, their mortgages. They did not receive many of the um, um, benefits of the New Deal the, of, of, of the, the time that um, really elevated uh, people's wealth profiles over time. The maps, though, don't tell the whole story. Language written into deeds also prohibited black home ownership in cities that weren't on the maps. Black people were not allowed to purchase properties in white areas because of racial housing covenants. So um, not only were uh, black neighborhoods redlined formally or informally, because not every city, including D.C., was officially redlined, but we knew the areas where we were allowed to live, where uh, uh, loans were allowed to be, refinancing loans were allowed to be uh, let. And so, for, for, so many black areas, if you were black and you lived in a black area, you were just precluded from wealth development. There was also denial in design. Government subsidized loans were also given to developers. Entire cities like Greenbelt in Prince George's County were built only for white families. It was kind of like the fence. It divided Burwood and Mendota. In Detroit, the Federal Housing Authority would not go ahead with the proposed development near a black neighborhood until the builders separated the communities with a half mile long, six foot high concrete wall. To this day, you can find similar structures in Texas, Florida, and in Arlington, Virginia. They bring students down here to actually talk to them about segregation, help them understand. This is only one facet of that story, but I think it's an important part of the story. Walls weren't the only barriers. By the 1950s, highways were being used to separate black and white neighborhoods. The impact was profound. You're talking about slavery, Jim Crow racism, then redlining. It precluded us from developing assets. When you don't have assets, you gotta take on more debt. You gotta take on more student loans. You gotta take out that loan for a business. If you had equity in your home, you wouldn't need to take out that loan. Most businesses are started with the equity in your home. And so if we can um, correct for this uh, housing discrimination, we can, we're also correcting for business development, community development, all these different things. Housing is such an important lever. The Fair Housing Act of 1968 sought to end the discriminatory practices, but today, more than 50 years later, the issues persist. Unfortunately, redlining remains a persistent form of discrimination 
that harms minority communities. Just last month, the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division announced a new initiative to crack down on redlining. This one has a 21st century focus. You know, technology companies and financial institutions are amassing massive amounts of data on each and every one of us and using it to make more and more decisions about our lives, including loan advertising and underwriting. We need a fair housing market that is free from the old forms of redlining as well as the new digital and algorithmic redlining. These algorithms are black boxes behind brick walls. When families and regulators do not know how decisions are made by these algorithms, we are unable to participate in a fair and competitive market free from illegal bias. And we will not allow robo-discrimination to proliferate in a new crisis. When we come back, the red line in lending, the burden on communities without equal access to banking, and who's stepping up to fill the gap. Eliminating economic disparities only helps, you know, uh, grow the economy. Plus, same house, same specs. So why is it worth less in one county than another? There are many forms of oppression and bias, and home value is one of them. The issue of undervalued appraisals and how it's affecting homes in Prince George's County. But first, another example of how this issue of redlining plays out in different aspects of everyday life. When it comes to health, formerly redlined neighborhoods are more likely to be near industrial areas. A study in the journal Climate found a greater risk of polluted air in these areas and less access to fresh food and grocery stores, all reasons that residents in formerly redlined neighborhoods are carrying a heavier health burden. Welcome back. And now to the issue of what some call modern day redlining. Black homeowners say they're being shortchanged when appraisers fail to value their homes for what they're actually worth. We spoke with the Prince George's County homeowner who's working to make sure others don't have the same experience she did. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Priestley. I'm a Prince George's County homeowner and resident. My family and I like to say we are Prince George's proud. Probably around 2015 or so, my husband and I, we knew that our family was going to grow. We already had two kids at the time. Um, my mom and my stepfather are with us often and we wanted a house that could grow with our growing family. I've lived in Prince George's County now for over 11 years. Ultimately, what I think I've learned and realized and really do love the most is the fact that we are community. When you think about the idea of um, you know, kids playing outside until the street lights come on. You know, you think about the sim simplicity of life before. Prince George's County has its own unique way of bringing those simple joys into everyday life. So one of the things that we learned as we were preparing to build our new home is that what it would cost to build was not equal to what the bank would finance. The home did not appraise for the actual cost of construction. In fact, our home, our builder built a home in Montgomery County that's almost the exact same square footage, largely the same you know, amenities and features and what have you, and that home sold for twice as much as our home could even appraise for. And we have to ask ourselves, how is that value perceived so differently? There are many forms of oppression and bias, and home value is one of them, right? We say black lives matter because we see the impacts of police brutality, hate crimes, and other things. And black votes matter, right? We talk about that as far as campaigns go. And black homes matter. It's one of the largest investments that most people will ever make in their lives. And so the thought of a home that is owned and occupied by um, a person of color being viewed as valued as less than a home owned by a white person is ridiculous on so many levels. And the fact that a county like Prince George's County is predominantly black and yet affluent, successful, um, thriving, right, a great place to live, somehow the homes here are deemed valued at less than that of homes in neighboring counties in both Northern Virginia and in Maryland. 
And so it's important for us to bring awareness to that reality that it's happening, but also to flag ways in which people can help, um, you know, kind of advocate for themselves and the resources that are out there. And so that's why we formed the Fair and Unbiased Appraisal Advocates. We are a group of elected officials, of homeowners, of realtors, um, of appraisers and so on that are working to bring equity and A, acknowledgement of the issue and B, improvement. It's challenging um, the status quo that's been there, but it takes, I think, individuals to say, let me make sure that my home that is being sold, once sold or once purchased, is listed for the actual cost so that we can stop being kind of locked into this very narrow window of, uh, of comps. We created a website that serves as a resource portal for other families to use um, to hopefully help other people understand how they can navigate through the appraisal process and really to exchange ideas and, and, and challenge each other to say, what are we not thinking about that hopefully will, will bring you know, better appraisals for other families. Still to come, a look at the national discussion surrounding redlining and the proposed solutions for reversing the residual effects. And if we do these things, we can actually restore the value that's been extracted by racism. And how black banks are filling a void to support underserved communities. I think that's one of the things that would really make a big difference and go a long way. It's been very successful for us. But first, how the issue of redlining is still affecting education. In the area of schooling, location means everything. Most Americans pay for schools through taxes. The higher the quality of housing, the more funding for schools. That means teachers get paid more and schools have better resources. And here's the catch. Better schools contribute to higher property values, which means they have more in taxes to spend on schools and on and on. Schools in formerly redlined areas are typically underfunded. Just last month, the Justice Department announced a new initiative to address another aspect of redlining, the role banks play in making sure all communities have equal access to credit. Black-owned banks have embraced that mission. Sonia Wells of City First Bank in D.C. explains how her bank is helping people who've been historically left out of the mainstream lending process. We were founded uh, back uh, 25 years ago uh, under the auspices uh, or for the purposes of making sure that families and communities and brown and black folks that they were uh, you know uh, given access to capital when they had previously been denied we do commercial lending only but we do uh, support families in various ways uh, on a consistent basis uh, like i said it's part of our dna in terms of what it is that we do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of working within the communities that we serve. You know, obviously those are the communities that have been typically underserved, uh, you know, in many ways, not just from a banking perspective or financial institutions, but also, you know, food and, you know, a host of other amenities are typically uh, not in those communities. And so we go out of our way to try and bring, you know, projects and developers together that will bring some of those uh, amenities and assets to those communities. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is really to help uh, the black families understand banking, understand the process, understand what they can do to uh, change the outcome. And you think about the assets may be very different or may be considerably less for a black family. Uh, the net worth is therefore impacted, credit scores, uh, the options that they have for lending. All of that, you know, impacts access to capital because, you know, there's an algorithm that's being utilized. It's not easy to protect yourself against, against an algorithm. Um, you know, in theory, uh, you would think uh, that uh, something that is, you know, uh, absent of individuals, you know, would uh, eliminate the bias, but the bias still exists, even in building the algorithms. And when you're talking about that the average white family has eight times the net worth of a black family or a brown family, that's where you know where that algorithm just is not working because it's, you know, nine times out of 10, it's going to result in a negative, um, you know, decision relative to the loan. I think the most important thing is uh, for all of us to consider is that when you have investment in the community, uh, that, you know, it really helps to grow the community. 
Uh, it brings families in, it brings additional businesses in, and you know, we're able to expand and make a difference from an economic perspective. So when you start there and then you start to build the infrastructure and build out, uh, then you'll see families grow, develop, and it's, it's, it's really um, a fantastic thing to see when you see a community grow and develop in that, you know, in that vein. Still to come, the national discussion on redlining and the search for solutions to end the inequities. Just like the pandemic, when our neighbors are sick, we are vulnerable. Right. And, and that's true economically as well. But first, another aspect from the fallout of redlining. When it comes to policing, a Boston University study suggests formerly redlined areas tend to have more negative interactions with police than others. Tactics like stop and frisk mean entire communities are subject to increased or over-policing, which in turn leads to greater involvement for residents in the criminal justice system. Those negative interactions also breed a lack of trust between law enforcement and those communities. The government policies that allowed housing discrimination put the American dream out of reach for many people. Now there is a national conversation about righting that wrong. Andre Perry from the Brookings Institution walks us through some of the proposed solutions. Yeah, my colleagues and I, Jonathan Rothwell of Gallup and David Harshbarger and I, we did a study on looking at home values in black neighborhoods where the share of the black population is 50% or higher. And, and we found that after controlling for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics, that homes in black neighborhoods are underpriced by 23%, about 48,000 per home, cumulatively, that about 156 billion in lost equity, 156 billion. And again, this is not because of education or crime, we control for those things. But 156 billion is a big number. In fact, it would have financed more than 8 million college degrees based upon the average amount of a four-year public public education, um, paid for or financed more than four million black owned businesses based upon the average amount black people used to start their firms, would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over and has doubled the economic burden of the opioid crisis. It's a big number. And so again, when, when we look at black communities, we should be looking for ways to restore that value because people are not sending their kids to college, they're not starting the businesses they need. And because of those actions, our communities are not developing in the, in the manner in which they, they could. So it's important that we identify those policies that still extract wealth so that we can change them and restore some of that value that's been extracted by racism. How do we do that? And, and I know so briefly uh, we were just talking about the fact that the communities that were redlined in the past aren't necessarily uh, the same people who were living in those communities then don't live in those communities now. Is there any way to truly fix that? You know, we've seen a lot of progress over the last few months. Um, Biden and, and HUD just announced recently that they created an interagency task force on appraiser, uh, appraisals. We need um, uh, accountability in place, we need enforcement, we need new metric, and that interagency task force that HUD and, and, and the Biden administration is putting together, that will help. Uh, help. So we're moving in the, in the right di direction in, in that regard. But I also say this, that that more and more people are just becoming aware of the impact of discrimination on, on their wealth profiles. And that awareness now is leading to more and more policy changes. So we just need to figure out new loan products to, 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 so that low income renters can then become um, buyers. We, could, we should figure out ways to get new credit scores because m much of the credit scores um, ignore the historic racism that extracted the wealth and disabling us from attaining assets. So our credit scores really reflect discrimination, not of our willingness to pay. And so we need new innovations, um, new zoning ordinances, for instance. And if we do these things, we can actually restore the value that's been extracted by racism. So how do you, when we look at when this was technically happening and then deemed illegal, how do, it was almost 100 years ago, how do you convince people today that something that happened 100 years ago is still having this negative impact? Well, I, I, I say let's take lessons from um, this pandemic we're in. 
when biz the, the business community was forced to shut their, their businesses um, because we wanted to stop the spread of the disease, mm -hmm. um, it, it caused harm to um, those business owners. The business community reached out to the federal government and said, you know, we need to be made whole. The federal government responded with PPP loan um, to, to businesses. For many white people who understand how the federal government bailed them out for um, this pandemic, they should understand that being socially distanced for generations has an impact. And so for me, it's always, um, I, I need, I, I want people to, to, to understand the facts. Now it's been anti-black discrimination that has impacted um, um, and shaped this country. But just like the pandemic, when our neighbors are sick, we are vulnerable. Right. And, and that's true economically as well. We need to invest in all Americans in the same way. And so for me, that's what I try to tell our, our brothers and sisters who don't quite get it, that they'll say, I didn't own any slaves, I didn't discriminate against any, anyone, yet, um, but they do understand that their, war, their the wealth profile would have been significantly different if the federal government didn't discriminate. So we're asking the federal government, the federal government to respond, not individuals, the federal government, the same way it empowered some, and not others, the federal government can correct and repair the damage that it did. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation about redlining and its impact on the way we live, the way we work, and the way we educate our children. We hope you'll continue the conversation within your own circles. And for additional resources, check out the NBC Washington app. I'm Sean Yancey, News 4.